Hi, I'm very good. I'm, my name is Bradley Gordon, um, and I'm an advisor to the, the Cambodian government, to the Ministry of Culture. I understand that back in 94, your company had an option of Khmer Antiquities, and we just trying to figure out where those pieces ended up. One of them is extremely important to Cambodia, and it was looted from a temple, and we've collected a lot of um, testimony about it. What we've been doing the last two weeks, three weeks, we've been going around the States and we've been visiting museums. We went to about 12 museums. We went to Asian Art Museum and the Museum of um, Fine Arts in Boston and the Brooklyn Art Museum and so on. Okay. Okay. I mean, totally, I mean, super appreciate that. That's, that's fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay, take care. Okay. Basically confiscating it. Um, I, I, you probably don't want to use that word, but <laughs> basically that's the look, word, right? If you, look, one of the dealers who probably was one brought, brought many of these to the auction. Um, he died about a, uh, a about two two years ago. Who was that? Douglas Latcher. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of him. The statue needs to go back home because the statue symbol as a Cambodian uh, ancestor, as a Cambodian god. Every time we go to temple, we expect to see the god over there, to see our ancestor over there. But when we go to the temple, we didn't see anything over there. People chop it out and then cut the neck, cut the legs, and then move away from, from the temple and then to the broker and to the dealer and to collectors. This country was racked by civil war for a 30-year period from the late 60s to the late 90s. Millions died, millions were made refugees. And in that time, this cultural heritage was stolen at a huge scale. The temples are some of the most spectacular ancient sites you can encounter. The one most people are familiar with is Angkor. I believe it's right to call it the largest religious complex in the world. It is absolutely enormous. These very large statues, uh, they're you know, four and five feet tall, some of them. They're incredibly beautiful. They're the product, obviously, of immense skill and, and a lot of uh, really impressive artisanship. Most people, however, would only have seen them in museums because the statues are all gone, and that's because they were all stolen. The Denver Art Museum is now returning four artifacts back to Cambodia after they were linked to a man who was indicted by prosecutors two years ago. Douglas Latchford was indicted after allegedly trafficking stolen artifacts. Douglas Latchford was a British businessman, lived really his entire adult life in Bangkok who made a lot of money in pharmaceuticals and real estate and was also the world's most prominent and, and arguably uh, most prolific dealer of Cambodian statues. Douglas was uh, known derisively among heritage activists as Dynamite Doug. And that was for the, uh, the rumored means by which some of his objects were extracted from temples. Douglas used this term for himself, describing himself as an adventurer scholar, which uh, is, is obviously calculated to, to create a kind of Indiana Jones vibe. Uh, that was not really him, but in fact, Douglas was a guy who liked five-star hotels and bespoke suits and, and nice restaurants. This is not someone who was ever uh, trooping around the jungle uh, in search of lost treasures. He got involved with something called the Thai Bodybuilding and Physique Sports Association, which is the official national organization for bodybuilders in Thailand. And uh, Douglas, who, who by this point was quite wealthy, uh, bankrolled the association. He ultimately served as the president. He was a businessman, and he did most of his business from the comfort of his home in Bangkok.
Items that uh, in one way or another uh, passed through Latchford's hands ended up in the collections of some very wealthy people, ended up in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, in the Norton Simon uh, in Pasadena, California, in the British Museum, the National Gallery of Australia. We don't actually know how many pieces he bought and sold, uh, certainly in the hundreds, perhaps in the thousands. We went into the Met and we took 3D images of every Cambodian piece that's on display and fully documented what is here. We will be bringing that back home and discussing with the team back in Phnom Penh to analyze and closely scrutinize you know, the details of these objects. There's been a big evolution in thinking around cultural heritage and, and who it belongs to. In 1970, there was a convention uh, that was put together through UNESCO, which is the, the UN body for cultural heritage, that laid down some ground rules for uh, how statues, you know, paintings, cultural objects essentially can be removed from their country of origin. The basic principle is post-1970, you are supposed to show that you have permission from the government of the country where an object originated to remove it. There's no indication that, that Latchford had permission. The Cambodian government uh, certainly never granted permission for the removal of any of these objects. Today I am proud to announce that we are returning 30 ancient works of art to the Kingdom of Cambodia. Organized looting networks, including looters affiliated with the Khmer Rouge, sent these statues to a well-known antiquities dealer, Douglas Latchford. The looters would go get what they could find, and they would bring it to the brokers who would get it into Thailand, and then ultimately it would find its way to Douglas. So there is a large team of researchers centered on an American lawyer named Bradley Gordon, who lives in Cambodia, who are now trying to track down objects that were looted from Cambodia. This team are interviewing these looters in great detail, uh, going through step by step everything they remember. They will have uh, Cambodian government archeologists dig up a temple and look for fragments, look for broken feet or pieces of pedestals. You can 3D match these fragments to what is known to be in museum collections or the collections of private collectors. If that works, you've found a crime scene. And that, as you can imagine, provides a basis to demand that these pieces be given back because they're stolen property. When I started, I was hired by the US Department of Justice. I went out with Cambodians and we went around the countryside and we met maybe 100, 200 witnesses and we spoke to them and we found one gentleman in particular, we call him the Lion. He moved up to become the head of a major gang and he had more than 300, 400 people working for him across the country. And he told me that the one thing that kept him going was the demand that people in Bangkok, and one person in particular named Sia Ford, who was Latchford, was eager to get Khmer antiquities. When I met the lion, I brought one of the books that Latchford had published, and he got very excited when he saw the front cover. He saw Shiva and Skanda, a father and child statue, extremely important statue. And he was excited and saying to his wife, I know this statue, I know this statue. And later he showed me the spot where he found it. And we dug and we found the arm and we found the air. I think uh, Luther now, they, they want to help us because they feel more likely they feel guilty. They feel so sad when everything just gone. 
they know also that those antiquities gone from Cambodia and it's a result from their activity, from their mistake also. Today I'm at the stone laboratory of the National Museum in Phnom Penh and behind me is Shiva with a statue of Skanda. We brought one of Lion's lieutenants to this very room a couple months ago and he saw Shiva and Skanda and he touched it and he said, I believe you now. I understand what you're doing and I see the results and they continue to help us. From about 2016, when a, a very prominent New York antiquities dealer named Nancy Weiner was charged criminally with possession of stolen goods, Douglas knew that he was in the crosshairs. And uh, he began working to try and head it off uh, through these negotiations with the Cambodian government. And his ask of the Cambodian government was that in exchange for me giving back my collection, I want you to ask the Americans not to prosecute. One day, a couple years ago, my phone rang and I answered the phone and it was Douglas. He had instructions not to talk to me at that stage. So he called me and he said, I'm back from the dead. And he started laughing and we started talking. He was an extremely charming man and a very good salesman. And there's no question about that. And I said to him, look, Douglas, we need your collection to come home. And if you truly love the Cambodian people, this would be the right thing to do. And he laughed and he said, yes, I, I would like to give back to Cambodia. I now have access to a lot of his correspondence. And I see that sadly he was actually selling his collection. He was trying to get rid of it and putting it in other people's hands. You know, he was uh, extremely busy trying to move his collection right up until the end. It's kind of sad, you know, for us as a Cambodian who have a very long, very great history. But now we, we seem to lose it. We, we become someone who have nothing. The antiquity is important because they are not the statue, they are not the object. They are belong to the, and our ancestor. So that is important that the statue, the, the antiquity came back, our ancestor came back to us and then we can continue our practice, our worship. In many ways, our work is just getting started. We're tracking more than 100 museums with more than 2,000 objects. Now there are some major collections out there. So we're taking a strong line when we're talking to museums and we're talking to private collectors, we're saying, prove to us you have a right to have it. It's stolen, we know it's stolen. Some of the museums are being very transparent and forthcoming and friendly about the situation and open to the discussion. Others are stonewalling, they don't want to talk to us. The US government has contacted private collectors and they've had a lot of incredible successes. You know, we had Jim Clark returning a collection that he paid more than $35 million for. Returning this artifact is like returning our pride, returning our soul back to our peoples. It's been very frustrating because we're doing all this work here in Cambodia in a country that is still developing without full cooperation from extremely sophisticated and wealthy institutions and without the help of private collectors. Many of them are billionaires. These individuals, a hundred of them, I know their names. I have their email addresses. They're out there. They are completely silent. None of them are coming forward and providing us information. If we had all that information, I think we could prove to almost every museum in the world most of their collection is stolen, it needs to come home. So while I walked into my museum and I saw this female statue, Koke style, so I feel very, very proud, feeling like miss each other. Like my heart like show up, I love this uh, statue so much. When I see, I never think about, I have chance to see this statue. Yes, very upset. If I don't have chance to visit here, I don't know where this statue gone.
and also uh, Cambodian young generation, new generation, no chance to see the real statue in our country.